Welcome back to the Laughing Dragon MXP San Francisco Modern 20K. I'm Tanny Grace Jomey, Andrew Olenbogen. This is going to be, sadly, our last round of coverage here. Andrew, I've actually immensely enjoyed doing coverage with you here today, but not to be sad. We've still got an all, another full round to go here. Yeah, uh, very much agreed. Uh, we've definitely watched some great magic, but, you know, we've got another good team of casters lined up with Jerry Thompson and Niall Joe Rivers later today. And, yeah, still another great round to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're both great their own way. It's debatable who's better. I, I, I'm i not going to say someone else might not say it. I'm going to say they're better, but that's only because of me. I'm not going to say it, take anything from you, Andrew. You're you're amazing. But it looks like this round, we have amazing, we got an amazing matchup here. Gagari Yogmoth against Five Color Creativity. Looks like a turn one Gilded Goose for Jennifer Wang here. Grabbing a steam. And a very quick development of mana here for the Five Color Creativity player. The creativity Yawgmoth matchup is pretty interesting in general, and the reason is because the Yawgmoth deck can often win after the end, if you will. As sometimes the creator deck puts in two Archons, and the Yawgmoth deck is like, all right, sack my Young Wolf, it comes back, sack my 1-2, my turn, combo you. Um, yeah, that was cute, yeah. <laughs> And, and that dynamic makes things very interesting because both sides do a lot of maneuvering, really picking their spots. Uh, you know, if the creativity deck goes for it too early, they can lose to just, uh, you know, the not kind of making enough Archons uh, in this way. But if they go for it too late, then maybe Yawgmoth's already at the table. The one one's died to Yawgmoth. You can't get anywhere. It's, it's, it's not really clear the right time. Yeah, really good point. This is one of the few decks that can kind of struggle off Archons in here. All right, looks like we're going to have a Teferi here on turn three. It's going to go ahead and bounce the token from Grist here, draw a card. And not really under pressure just yet of being killed as well from Jennifer. So this Teferi might stick around and got a pretty good start from both the players here. And looking at the, the list here from Tank Fin Wang, it's sort of a more classical style of creativity list. We've got some hard evidences, we've got this bitter reunion, less of kind of the newer white cards, more of the, the old school creativity list, if you will. Yeah, just like the pure combo-ish version, or like like you said, kind of the first time we saw these decks coming around and getting really good. Eh, eh. He's, he just likes the classics. You know, Mr. Wallen likes the classics over here, so he's just staying with his... Oh, I said the Teferi wasn't in Jeopardy. I spoke too soon. Drago guy is going to come on over to haste and attack Teferi down back over the creativity player. The board getting a little cluttered over on that Yakma side. That always gets you a little bit of a worry. But expressive veneration. I'm going to go ahead and put a ley line into exile. Didn't see what got put into hand, but any pesky permits going to be able to be dealt with here this turn, looks like. Happen. Presumably, Grist getting taken out, but hard yeah. to know for sure. I would think it's going to be the Grist as well. Looks like that's what's going to happen. Hmm. But all I, right, I mean, if Jennifer has Yogg this turn, it's going to be tough for the creativity player. Now buckle up. I think I saw a Court of Calling in Jennifer's hand. All right, that's Yogg of sorts. Yogg at home. <laughs> All right, look, Young Wolf, still mana neutral on the, on the uh, quarter column. And the Wall of Roots is two if Jennifer yep. wants to play it. Yep, there we go. I say Wall of Roots into play. This is still mana neutral, but it looks like it's going to be a pass here for Jennifer. What she's sweating now, I think, is a spell pierce. Uh, because I think if she courts for Yogg here, she cannot also have two mana up to pay for a pierce. Which means, if there is a spell pierce, then she kind of doesn't have anything with the Grist answered and the payoff countered. Also, if creativity gets cast this turn, you can maybe just do it in response to creativity, and then you don't have to worry about uh, spell pierce. But it looks like there's going to be five lands possible unless he goes and gets. As I say, we might just get two tokens from. Yep, double dwarven mine, two tokens. It looks like it's going to be a creativity for two here. Then we're going to go ahead and crack a fetch in response. If she goes, it, it, okay, wait. If Ping Fang goes for creative for two, then the Yogg is going to kill both yep. the tokens. He'll get no Archons and lose the game on the spot. Yeah, however. We'll say this is going to be brutal, yeah. Well, but he could go for creativity for one, hold up Spell Pierce, and counter the, the, the cord. Greedy just doesn't have the Spell Pierce, I and mean, the Spell Pierce is purely speculative on my part. 
Yeah, um, the, well, Spillsbury's got discarded earlier, too, to the bitter reunion, so the odds of having one's a little bit lower, but yeah, I think this is just going to be Yogg in response, and uh, this is going to be real, real rough. Uh, yeah. All right, because, okay, here's what's about to happen, uh, for those unfamiliar. So first, both Undying creatures are going to be sacked, both tokens are going to be killed. Uh, Jennifer's going to draw two cards. Then, one of her other creatures is going to be sacked, removing the, the counter from one of the Undying creatures. Uh, she can attack first if she'd like, however she wants to do it. Um, from that point, she basically has a Yawgmoth to guard, that she can pay one life as many times as she wants, as long as she has life points, to draw cards. Uh, some point during that process, she'll probably find Blood Artist, Blood Artist or a way to find Blood Artist, and the game will end on the spot. Well put. Jennifer in a commanding position here now, as you said. Infinite ways to combo off. See another young wolf in the hand. See a bow master. Just yes. maybe. How do you want to close the game from here on out? I think from this point. Let's see, how does she want to do this? Take a yeah, look I at mean, how much damage she can do. Might want to keep up creatures to cord with. You know, there's there's some decisions being made here. Uh, hard to say if any of them really matter, but you know, might as well do it, right? Yeah, another wall of roots added here. Man immediately added from Oliver's Young Wolf added to the play. There we go. There's the play you're talking about. The draw yeah, card sure. here, take the <laughs> counter off. Sacrifice it again. Yeah. Here comes the combo. So we're going to draw cards until we don't want to anymore. Or until we run out of life, whichever is first. Clear. If Jennifer quote unquote misses, that is, if she doesn't find Cord or Blood Artist, you know, in, in time to deal lethal, it's not like she's gonna lose. It's more like she might have to pass the turn and then still be roughly 100% to win the game. Uh, <laughs> yeah, try to decide if they want to play the Grist here or leave up Bowmasters. It looks like the Grist is gonna happen. You can still play Bowmasters during your opponent's turn here with the Wall of Roots, so. Mill another Yogamoth, make another 1 1. Say go. Sure, and, and this is where yeah, she decides to stop. Player. Yeah, <laughs> the creative player. I was going to say, I, I fully expect to see a, a, a card drawn into a concession here. So, quick game one over to Agar Yogamoth. And what a court of calling there in response to that creativity. Just very well played for Jitterber here. Had the patience to wait for it in her main phase. And then, in response to that creativity for two, absolutely blowing out a creativity player. But again, if you're tinking there, what, what are you supposed to do? Just, like, hold on to your creativity, no. hope to find a spell at some point, lose if they if you're going to hard cast Yogg in the meantime? Like, you, you kind of have to go for it um, and get destroyed if they have it. It's, it's, it's sort of just unfortunate. No, I 100% I agree with you. I don't, I don't think you can afford to sit around and wait. Yeah, so like, there's not really a lot you can do. You kind of just have clear, to take your lump, yeah. Yes. Historically, most people have thought this matchup was uh, Yawgmoth favorite for this reason. Not unwinnable, because the Community Tech does have some moves. They can play a long sort of controlling game on the Yawgmoth that kind of resources. It's possible for the Creative Tech to win, but in general, Yawg is thought to be better in, the, in this matchup. Sure. Anything special on the sideboard is going to really stand out to you here? Um, It looks like the Creativity Deck has a, a one of, fun of, Hollowed Moonlight, which is pretty interesting, uh, to really get some cords on dying creatures, etc. Um, in addition to some normal tools like Stern Scolding, uh, could also board in this Sarah's Emissary plan instead of the, the Archon plan. I don't know how interested Tinkbank is in that. It, it's sort of good. It stops you from being comboed and protects your creatures from Yogg, but it does leave them vulnerable to Grist. So that one I'm not sure about. the players. Uh, I see that Hollowed Moonlight getting kind of brought to the front there. I think the player kind of agrees with you here. Possibly that's one of the ones that's coming in here. Let's say it's in the it's in the actual hand here. We're into the game here. Turn three. This looks like a Teferi from our creativity player. Get the hand cam uh, version of the game here this time around. Yeah. A little strange, but it's fine. It looks like a Wall of Roots was just bounced. Mm. Yep, I think you're correct there, Andrew. Well, 
Hey, Anurag, are you around? Oh, you're good. Sorry about that, everybody at home. There we go. <laughs> right. Anurag was dealing with a uh, an issue on something else and didn't have a chance to switch us back to the main view, but there we go. Everybody in the chat, let's take a minute to thank Anurag for putting this coverage on this weekend. Brought to you by Heavy Play. I think it's awesome what he does with his backpack streams. I don't think there's a harder working person in the industry than Anurag Das. And, uh, you know, he was single-handedly co uh, carrying magic coverage for a few years there, straight out of a backpack. you got to love it. Uh, very good friend of mine, and I'm very thankful that I get to do this with him as often as I do. Yeah, I think it's shocking how much coverage we'd lose if t tomorrow Anurag was, for some reason, able to do it. Uh, it's, it's really a lot. Yeah. I think we're, probably one of the most underappreciated people in this space as well. We love you, Anurag. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, back to the game. Looks like expressive iteration here from Juan. I guess those are those lands do not make blue red, but we'll just we fix go. that really quick. Yeah. Kind of hard sometimes when all the lands are a million colors, look really different, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, and especially you know you might be playing someone else's cards, like you might not have never seen this art before. It, yeah. it, such things happen. Mm. What's the what's like the have you ever had a bad experience of playing somebody else's cards or like a weird experience before? Yeah, it honestly happens to me a lot because the person I borrow cards from the most plays like only foils, alt art, like, you know, drip versions, basically. Ugh. One of the worst ones for me, and I say worse, this is very nice of them. I remember I showed up to like some big SEG event or something once, right? And uh, I forgot my legacy deck. Oh, wow. And one of my friends is like, yeah, he's like, just send me your list. I'll just, I'll sleeve it up and I'll have it ready for you. And I start like shuffling it and looking at it. He's like, oh yeah, just be careful when you're shuffling it. And I start looking through it and it's just the most expensive version of every card possible. Like my duels were black border and stuff. And I was like, man, I don't even want this. Like, like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like, I don't want to be responsible. responsible for this. <laughs> yeah, what happens if, I, if my deck gets stolen or something? Like I'm yeah, down thousands of dollars. I'm an idiot. <laughs> All right, here's my car. Here's the keys to my car. We'll just call it a wash. <laughs> like, mm. All right, so the hard evidence is getting cast. This this classical card from the old school builds of creativity. Um, gonna stem the beatdowns a little bit, although obviously that's not Jennifer's main plan in the matchup. I want to point out this is the third different crab we've seen today. Another thing I didn't think we'd see in modern. <laughs> You're right. A lot of crabs on camera. Also, I didn't think we see three different ones, Andrew. That's a that's a, that's got to be some kind of record. Yeah, it really is. Hmm. All right, back oh. over to the creativity side. This game, Jennifer has just deployed the up, which is pretty reasonable. But what it does mean is Tinvan can now try to, like, lay line binding it, get off the table somehow. Um, Jennifer can't draw that many cards off it right now. She probably only wants to draw one or two. Uh, and that means he might have a chance to remove it, recover, and then creativity from there. Although, definitely the longer it's in play, the higher chance something catastrophic happens. See if he's got step number one here. See if he has one of those ley lines. Lots of cards available. Same thing. Speaking of drip that we've seen this tournament, loving this jacket that he's got on too. Players not only expressive with their uh, their cards today, really bringing it in the wardrobe game too. I do, I do agree with that. I, I do, I do really respect that jacket. I wear that jacket. Um, I, I would definitely <laughs> wear that jacket. <laughs> mm. All right, step number one is going to be sacrificed in this air mace. It's going to get a dwarf in mind. That's going to bring along a one-one token here. There is a Yawgmoth in play though, so the token might not be long for this world. Let's yes, see. I mean, it's interesting. Okay, something teaming could do here is could go for creativity on the crab and the clue. Right. Um, no, it doesn't make him immune to the Yawgmoth, but it does mean, like, if Jennifer wants to stop just one of the creatures generating, she has to sack three things to kill the crab. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how interested he really is in that, though. Here we go. We're taking care of Yawg the hard way. Prismatic ending for four. Wow. That's not something you see every day. The, uh, here we go. Four different colors. Smack that thing. All right. But uh, honestly, 
uh, on the whole, not not bad for teaming at all. I mean, look, Jennifer could easily just not have another payoff, even after casting her pseudo divination. Um, and if that's the case, that's his window. Yeah, and something that's a little telling here is he went and got the Dwarven Mind and put the 1-1 one -one play before doing this, right? So, like, it kind of exposes the Dwarven Mind to it, but like you said, that might not be relevant, but it means that the Steam Vent stays untapped here. So does that, does that put something like Spell Pierce or something on your mind If that with this kind of play? Like, why did my opponent, you know, sequence it this way and leave this mana up? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think there's Jennifer here. You should, you should almost assume your opponent has Spell Pierce. Or maybe, like, Spell Snare. I mean, they have some one-mana blue interaction. Uh, to be clear, there is a one of Spell Snare in two things list. Uh, oh, God, love it. <laughs> <laughs> there's just no way he's doing that by accident. It, it's, it's very intentional. Or it's a really good bluff. All right, Strangle Root, guys. Spell Snare check. So we got one Are mana off of a Wall of Roots, and then we need to tap a land here. There we go. Quick Strangle Root, guys. It's going to resolve. We do have an 0-3 grab in play. I will say, Jennifer choosing to only sack one creature there, that, that is just the Orc Army, not the Bowmasters or the Wall of Roots, is, I think, something of a sign of strength. She's like extreme strength, but but her hand is at least soft. So we got an attack, and uh, we're going to block the 1-1 one, one here, which may be playing around another uh, Bowmaster here. You don't want to give up the 0-3 just to block one extra point of damage, playing a little safe. So it looks like this is going to be Blood Artist and Young Wolf attached to, I'm sorry, added to the board here. Pass back over to the Creativity player. Shields are down, Vanna's tapped out, only three creatures up, so here we go. Big Creativity. For two. In response. What was that? I think I missed that card. It was a force of vigor on the clue token. Force of vigor on the clue token. So only one of these is gonna happen in Oh boy. Is that Sarah is that Sarah Emissary we're looking at here? That is. I'm gonna double check the uh the text on this one myself. I mean I, I can't one hundred percent see the art, it's a little blurry, but I, I think, think it's, it's a Sarah Emissary. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's necessary. Hmm. Double checking here okay, so real quick. If it is necessary, yeah, that's Sarah's necessary. Yep. Okay. Then he had to choose between naming creature and naming planeswalker. Uh, the point of naming planeswalker would be that you're immune to grist, but creature is better in all other respects, so is probably the more natural name. Uh. We don't know what was named. There is a, I think there was a Grist in Jennifer's hand. So it makes me believe that maybe Planeswalker was the name. Hmm. All right, hard evidence I mean, cast here. Wouldn't be crazy. I mean, it does mean you're vulnerable to Yogg and vulnerable to normal combat steps. But on the other hand, just having a 7-7 seven, seven your opponent can't kill, I mean, does go a long way. Yeah, 7-7 seven, seven Flyer ends games pretty quickly. And this was an attack as well uh, from the Emissary here. Crab's going to be left back on defense. Pretty potent at blocking, but... I, I don't know. I, how do you not say Creature, though, with Blood Artist in play? Chat's saying think. that they, they think that Creature was set, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I maybe don't know it was Creature. That. Yeah. Also, Jennifer's down to six here. I didn't realize the life total was that low. It just got updated. Oh, well, in that case, you would attack regardless. Hmm. All right, Court of Calling was the top deck. I could have swore I saw Chris there. Earlier. Maybe I mis misremember things. Uh, Grizz was pitched to the Force of Vigor. That's what it was. Okay, so that yeah, that's that's huge then. Yeah, my uh, I definitely missed that play earlier. I apologize. Looks like we're possibly quarter calling here, probably for a Grist. And that would make a lot of sense. And this can play around Spell Pierce as well. Okay, I mean, if the Sarah area gets cleaned up, I mean, I mean, Tigmeg's only at nine, but the Yaw players may be sitting pretty. Yeah, I was going to say, this would be a pretty big turnaround. Is that Tails End? That is Tails End countering the wow. Grist activation and ending the game on the spot. Wow. That's a great reason to name Creature, by the way, if you have Tails End just lined up. I, was like, I haven't... I can't remember the last time I saw his Tails End cast, but like definitely can't remember the last time I saw it. It's a, it used to stop a, uh, an ability as well. That's awesome. 
I mean, Tails End gets Grist any way you do it. It gets Grist off court, it gets Grist from the hand. <laughs> Grist does yeah. not get through Tails End. Tails End, a really sweet one. I remember when it first came out, we saw it a lot in like a bunch of different places, and it's kind of uh, gone the way side. But I've seen it a few times here this week. I think somebody had it in their sideboard yesterday as well. Ready? All right, we're going back to game three. It looks like we have a mulligan from Jennifer here. Wait, are we back to game one? Is that what just happened? Because sure. this has thing on the play. Mm. I think we Something might have... Happened. Yeah, there we go. We're going to come back to the booth for just a second, maybe fix this up. Get in. All right, it sounds like we may be missing game three. Oh, we're still going to be watching game three. Okay. Uh, Anurag is uh, fixing a small little problem on the back end. The loveliness of live television. Uh, we, we apologize for the, the brief technical respite, but we will have to be there we go. quite soon. And it looks like we're immediately in it. Not wrong on top of things here. I think Anurag's like almost running solo this weekend. Might have like one person helping him out, so he's doing the, Lord, the Lord's work over there. But still, right, despite it being game three, is a Gilded Goose opening. <laughs> yep. All right, Gilded Goose. On the start for Jennifer, add a little bit of ramping, a couple extra th uh, things into play here. Sure. Looks like we're gonna have a grist here on turn two. Okay, and the grist is gonna get immediately down, it looks like. Oh, sorry, uh, I'll catch try to complete the game. Line binding to come in, take care of the Grist. Play we've seen multiple times here in this matchup. Seems the Grist pretty, one of the more impactful cards here in this matchup. Yes, and, and I'm actually a little surprised to see the Gilded Goose left in Jennifer Wayne's deck, uh, just because it's actually a card that's commonly cited out in matchups where you don't care about life and don't necessarily need the speed of those extra one drop accelerants. Mm. Looks like Wall of Roots, another accelerant, going to get added to the board here for Jennifer. See a court of calling in hand. I think a was that a pick of your poison as well. A couple of really powerful cards in the matchup for Jennifer in her hand here. And right. Pick your poison is a bit of a weird one against creativity because there will be like okay, obviously it's against leyline binding, but does it do much else? It, it seems like the answer is maybe no. I mean, I guess maybe you could hit like a clue token, something like that. Maybe finish off a Sarah Emissary and Archon. Was that the idea? Because she knows he's on Sarah Emissary. She's using it because it, it always gets through Sarah Emissary. Is that the point? Yeah, maybe. It looks pretty good there, though, taking care of that ley line, getting that Grist back. And we've seen how impactful Grist has been in these games and how much both these players have wanted it or wanted it off the board. Actually, upon reflection, this seems like a really heads up cyborg twist to her wing because normally I think Pink Poison is super narrow against creativity. Uh, you, killing Archon after he comes into play, I think, is mostly a fiction. It'll get discarded from your hand, or it'll be too much value, or just like it's not really where you want to be. But against their emissary, that's not true at all. This card always kills their emissary. Doesn't matter what you protection from. It actually is kind of a nice adjustment. Yeah, I was saying, I'm, I'm really liking it. Answers a couple things as well. You know, like. There were Fable, you know, Answers, Ley Line. It looks pretty sweet, actually, yeah. Back over to Jennifer. Looks like we're going to take some food. Untap, tap, take a turn here. Got this active Grist, a bunch of creatures, Court Calling in hand. Lots of options for Jennifer here this turn. Mills over another Grist. We've seen this so many times this weekend, Andrew. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I think it's the third or fourth time this weekend we've seen Grist mill Grist. It is wild that it just has that li little extra boost on the card, you know? Yeah. It's really 1.2 insects or whatever. Yeah, I'd actually, like, never seen it happen before this weekend, and now it just keeps happening. It's it's making up for the law of averages, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like it, it never happens to, it always happens. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. 
something I think is important to point out here is that, okay, some creativity decks have some sweepers in the sideboard. Uh, something like Anger of the Gods, Brotherhood's End, something of that nature, uh, so that they can clean up large boards like this. TV has nothing like that. Uh, oh, that's kind of important. It looks like and he got to the table to make matters yeah. worse. Yeah, the thing we uh, fetch with a Scalding Tart into turn there, and Jennifer's turn, and in response, since there was no mana up, she went ahead and courted for a bunch to make sure she gets Yawgmoth into play with this big of a board. And like you said, no sweepers. How does Timfang get out of this? Uh, I am not sure he does. Uh, let's see. It's going to take... Uh, it's going to take a lot. I mean, I know we have seven cards, but... Okay, I mean, I guess it starts with killing the Yogg somehow. We, we bind the Yogg. Jennifer will draw a few cards. We hope she draws mostly bricks. <laughs> like, we're sort of just in it for the long haul, but there's no quick out with creativity given that Yogg is in play. So, yeah, I think he just kind of needs to grind through all this. That's that's a tall task to ask for, too. This is a lot to grind through. Yes. Oh, I, I understand that I'm asking for the moon here. Uh, but... I, I mean, I think that's what his out looks like. I, I don't see a way around binding the Yogg and hoping it works out from there. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, this is... You're even starting to attack for a decent amount here. Like, I know there's not a ton of power in play, but you know, there's the fifth insect's about to come into play. Yogg's got two power. I mean, you can attack for a decent little bit almost every turn. That's true. And uh, not irrelevant is the fact that Grist has enough loyalty to ult. Uh, the, the very not often happening ultimate. I almost never see that one happen. We're going to see a lot of firsts for me on coverage here this weekend. Maybe we get a Grist to finally go off. Looks like after this attack, the thing's going to go ahead and find a Dwarven Mine, get a 1-1. One, one. Then three mana is going to do something here. So there's the 1-1. One, one. How does he think that in some games in which uh, you end up being a beatdown plan because y'all gets Pithing Needle or Curse Totem or something like that, I think the Wizard Ult does come up a fair amount, but only in that subset of games that are already weird, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it doesn't happen too often. You see it every now and then when, like, the boards are unbelievably cluttered, like you said, when they just go really long and stuff. That makes sense. All right, I'm trying to remember the name of this. It's Molten something. Uh, Molt Valakut Awakening, sorry. Valakut Awakening, and he's going to go ahead and pitch a bunch of the cards to his hand, get a bunch more. Looks like he found a Leyline Binding here. He'll target the Yawgmoth, and how many cards does Jennifer want to try to draw in response here? Looks like none. Just going to go ahead and get the damage through. Don't, don't mind that at all. Well, I mean, I think none is a sign of extreme strength. I mean, she thinks she can win. She doesn't need any cards. Like, uh, perhaps because they're sort of saved you at the ready. So he's going to put the Yawgmoth back into play. Mm, actually, I think this is a small misstep from Jennifer because if she responds to the Leyline Binding, she just gets in two more damage. Oh, because it stays in play attacking? Yeah. Yes. Uh, she might be thinking of the old O-Ring wording that, that did not uh, function in that way, but... Hmm. I think we're dating ourselves again here, talking about the, the old wording of the O-Ring effects. <laughs> <laughs> that is possible. I'm willing to acknowledge that. But, you know, for, for, all, for all I know, uh, you know, Jennifer's been at it a long time too. Maybe she, she remembers O-Ring as well. No, definitely. It's definitely a very good chance of that. So it looks like the Ogma's going to go ahead and kill off one of the Dwarven Mind Tokens. Draw a card for Jennifer. It looks like another Court of Calling added to her hand along with a secondary Grist. Damage, I think, got through here. Or is about to. Yeah, the light total change. There we go. Loses one, kills the, another one of the one ones. Sacrifices the Gilded Goose. The damage gets through here. So, I think it's probably at somewhere around eight right now. Yeah, I mean, I mostly would classify the damage as enough. Um, enough. Yeah. <laughs> 
sure. But like, okay, because of the Gristall, Ting Fang is definitely going to be dead next turn. Like, I don't know exactly how many creatures stays in the graveyard. I just suspect that between the attacks and the, the Gristall, it, it's it's going to be enough damage. Uh, it looks like there's three, I believe. I think they just okay, that is less than I'd expect. I admit. There uh, could be more though. There's a quarter calling Jennifer's hand. She has a wall of roots in play along with the Ogmoth, so there could be some activations first. Yeah, I think he's going to need to do something really special this turn, but I'm not exactly sure how he can do that. Uh, for example, let's say he goes hard evidence into creativity on the clue token, which Jennifer cannot easily stop. It just doesn't seem like one Sarah Emissary is going to be good enough here. So at that point, there's a question of like, all right, then what is the plan? I don't really see it. Right, looks like Ridden 6, deal 1 damage Yawgmoth, follows up with Lightning Bolt on Yawgmoth again. Sure. We're going to sacrifice uh, Wooded Foothills here in response to fetch up. She can just go get another copy of Yawgmoth here if she wants, or just something to attack for a bunch of damage as well. Yeah, it looks like she does have enough by exact count to go to Yawgmoth, right? Because the wall is effectively right. two, four, five. Yeah. That's maybe the play? All right, well, Hollowed Moonlight in response to uh, Court of Calling will be pretty good here, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, she does not have to exile anything just this scenario. She can just fail to find. It's it's totally okay. Um, but the Yawgmoth will leave the battlefield... Whether that will make a difference in the game is unclear to me. Yeah, it's gonna put another creature into the graveyard for the Grist ultimate here. Uh, I, I believe I believe Tin Fang is at a lower life total than we have on the board. I don't think the players have updated the life totals oh. for a little bit. Mm. That's concerning because Jennifer I'm has eight sure. damage, an activation and an attack for four. I mean, four plus four is eight. Uh, so she only needs three more damage if he's at three less life or if she can you know in some way up the damage by a little bit uh, this could easily be lethal this turn i guess a stranger geist is still yeah, so one short that's an example minus five down to two. yeah they're counting up the creatures again it looks like there might be five now oh, you already all right so she's gonna add a mana during uh, no, Oh, she already did it. She can't do it twice. Ah, uh, yeah. She, she was thinking I could put another counter on the wall of roots, untap the counter to kill them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but she that is not legal, but roots has been used. Is that another Yawgmoth on the top? I think it was. Yep. So I think this might be lethal. Hmm. Just play Yawgmoth, sacrifice a bunch of... Sacrifice your wall, sacrifice your... Can Yawgmoth sacrifice to himself? No, Yawgmoth is another. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Yawgmoth isn't really about sacrificing to himself, you know? Yawgmoth is a little bit more selfish than that. Yeah, he's greedy. He wants everything else. Mm. Oh, there we go. Play Grist. Keep the old Grist. Grist. Yeah. <laughs> keep the going. There we go. This should be enough. Well, yes. there we go. Sacrifice the Wall of Roots. And that should be enough for Jennifer to win the game. <laughs> really creative way to get the last couple points across on those last turns, but that's what Yawgmoth does. I mean, okay, the ending there definitely was nice from Jennifer, and it, it, it you know was relevant. It did cut off uh, Timmy's outs even further, not give an additional top deck, etc. But even if she draws a basic land that turn, can't quite kill him, puts him to three, he's in a really bad spot. He needs immediate creativity for Sarah's Emissary, name creature, which will that... Sorry, he needs actually immediate creativity for two to name creature and planeswalker to get out of this. It's that is not easy. Uh, I, I don't exactly know how you do it. You have to have like hard evidence plus land plus creativity, something like that. It's pretty challenging. Yeah, I was gonna say it was a really, really rough spot to be in. I don't think there was any way for him to get out of that. And Jennifer is the victorious player in that round, so it looks like we're gonna go to our backup match. Don Hubbard, who we had earlier in the tournament, playing that domain zoo deck against. Francisco Canner playing Bant Hammer. Hmm. Looks like it's it yeah, extra so colors in the Hammer deck here. As of late, uh, the Hammer decks have not been popular in the modern format, possibly because of the you know, extreme popularity and dominance of Yogg, one of its tougher matchups. Uh, but uh, 
a dedicated hammer pilot can still make it through, and uh, let's see how Francisco Kenner performs. John's already up just a little bit here. He's got a ley line in play turn zero, and quite a few things into play turn one for Francisco as well. So tons of cards into play before both players have even had a turn. Let's see how does John want to start this, taking his time here on turn one. We're going to go ahead and put that Murktide into the graveyard. We're going to go back over to the Hammer player. Urza Saga going to be the first chapter. Yep. That is Forge Anew. It's Forge Anew because I cannot see what that card is yet. Yeah, it's Forge Anew, the kind of C-string equipper in Hammer these days. Often must have just a few copies. Uh, you know, Saga and Crystal Pattern are not. Or, sorry, yeah. Saga, Saga's aid and Crystal Pattern are not quite enough. Hmm. Back over John. Doesn't look like he has the turn two side on this game, but he does have a preordain here. One top, one bottom. I'm going to draw that top card back into John's hand here. Play the Scalding Tarn. Got for a little bit of mana. And this Lightning Bolt's going to take care of that Onathopter. Sit back Francisco from a couple of his permits here. Yeah, but Francesco's situation is still just firing on all cylinders. I mean, he has this Urza Saga making tokens. Uh, those are all big threats in themselves. It, at the end of it, he'll find a hammer, which he already has the Equipper lined up for and resolved. I mean, the things are going very well for him. Looks like he's going to go ahead and make a car instruct here. This, his first car instruct, but there's usually another one waiting behind this as well. And that's not it at the turn as well. He can actually tap this with the Springleaf Drum as well to play it. I think that's another Springleaf Drum. Not one of the ones you want to draw on multiples too often, but it is another artifact for these car trucks, so at least a little bit relevant there. Back over to John, let's see what he's got here this turn. And something I'll mention here, uh, as we've discussed the various domain zoo lists several times on this stream, is that this sort of blue domain zoo list is, I suspect, worse against Hammer than the other builds. Uh, that's one of the trade-offs you make when you play this build. Uh, just in general, Murktide is a not a good deck against Hammer. Hammer is a good match with Murktide. And these cantrips and wheel spinning is not where you want to be. You need immediate interaction. You cannot afford to take time off to find your cards with cantrips in this matchup. Yeah, Hammer is one of the ones that will very much punish you if you take too much time. Another Lightning Bolt here is going to be good enough to take care of that car and truck. That's going to be followed up by sign of Draco here. So... Very powerful turn here for John. Then takes away the threat from Francisco and puts a big one of his own into play. All right, Urza Saka's on three. Triggers on the stack. Let's see how Mr. Kaner wants to utilize the Saka and start before it gets cashed in for something from his deck. Well, he has some interesting options here. Uh, for example, let's say he chooses not to make Construct. He could animate Inkwath Nexus, uh, find Hammer off the Saga, put the Hammer on Inkwath Nexus with the Forge Anew, uh, and force a chump block from the sign. Uh, now, is that better than having construct? I I'm not sure, but it's at least comparable. It looks like he's going to do exactly that line. I was going to say, that one sounds pretty hard to, to pass up for me. You, know, you get the scion, you get the hammer into play. I, I kind of like this. Yeah, and you do break up that combo, like all their things lose lifelink and stuff. Uh, now, now, the combo is not incredibly relevant against hammer, but it might be nice to get it off the table. Uh, just slow down their clock a little, make it a little easier to block their stuff, not give them the life total to, uh, you know, play around too long. Looks like an extra copy of Ink Moth Nexus, a Hollowed Fountain, and is that a Sakarda's Aid left over in the Hammer player's hand? So it looks like we've got a block here, move the Hammer over. John's going to gain four here, but like you said, might that be relevant with these Ink Moth Nexuses? Next eye? Nexuses? These multiple Ink Moth Nexus in play. Yes. 
And, okay, obviously these leftovers are a bit lackluster on the one hand, but on the other hand, all Francesco needs is a single land to be able to eliminate both Inkamoths, send them both in, and then at instant speed equip Hammer to whichever one isn't blocked or removed or what have you. So, his, his board is kind of terrifying. I'll say very well played, Francesco here. Let's see if John is up to the task to, to do something about this. What, what does John have that can even stop something like that? Let's say he's already had to chump block once. Do you think that can interact here? Maybe does Bolt even get this done from here? Well, yes, he can wait till Francesco equips and then Bolt to like buy a turn. It's not a flawless answer. Uh, but the best answer, I think, would be a, a ley line binding because that could take out either the Forge Anew or the Hammer itself and thereby prevent this whole equipment thing from happening. Uh, so if he has a land binding, I actually think John Hubbard is sitting pretty. If he doesn't, uh, I think he's in trouble. Um, well, if he doesn't and, have one, this will help him maybe find one. Oh, that's true. from John. If he does find one, I'll just stop hitting on the cantress this matchup. So, you know, that, that would be a big swing. Absolutely. can possibly buy... Wait, does this buy him a turn? Hmm. If, well, not alone. alone. Alright, so one of the other means he can animate both the Nexus here. Yeah, because I mean, Fran Francesco gets simply equipped to the Nexus that isn't blocked. Now, if John Hubbard also has a removal spell, a lightning bolt or something of that nature, then we're talking since that would take down both Nexi the blocked one will die in combat, the unblocked one will be, be removed by Bolt in response to the equip. Uh, and maybe that's enough that Francisco might consider not attacking, but that seems really conservative. Yeah, I was going to say, you can see he's not excited about having to make this play. I'm of the... So, I'm of the opinion most of the time that either you have to make them have it, or if you think about it, like, can you even afford to not make them have it here? Because if you don't attack here... Then, like, you just give John a whole other turn to possibly draw it if he doesn't, or find another preordain to find, you know, what it is that's going on. Like, I don't think you can give him the time. I think you have to go for this. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Yep. All right. <laughs> Looks like we've got the block into. Okay, I will put the hammer on the unblocked creature, and that is enough infect damage that your life total does not matter. So the hammer it's... player up one nothing here. Didn't think he's even much hammer to this week, but Bant Hammer is a nice little uh, change of pace. Well, to be clear, so what the green is for, which I'm sure many in the chat are wondering, so let, let's briefly discuss it, is there is just a single Haywire Might in the main, uh, tutorable via Urza Saga, of course, as needed, uh, plus the ever-present sideboard card, Pick Your Poison in the sideboard. Those are the only green cards in his deck, so it's, it's very lightly green. But I do imagine in this matchup that Picker Poison will come in because, well, otherwise, why would we play it for? I mean, this is the matchup where it's at its best, breaks up the Leon Sign combo, hits Leyline Binding, tons of targets. Uh, it gets around all forms of hexproof. So, yeah, I imagine that's why Francesco is doing this. Yep, makes a lot of sense to me. All right, looks like we're going to be jumping into game two with our players here. Both of them taking a look at their opening hands. See if there's any mulligans for either one of these players. John Hubbard, the new just, deck, is going to be on the play. I'll just mention that Lava Spur Boots from the new set is in this Bant Hammer deck, um, as well as the Coat and Assimilation Aegis in some of the kind of flex equipment. Yeah. Aegis is a really sweet one. It's a good piece that you can search up as a removal spell. Yes, agreed. And the fact that you can turn your creatures into things you exile, I think, obviously, it's it's not hugely relevant, but I think it comes up more than you might think. Uh, you know, make an Ornithopter into a Shieldred. Sometimes that wins games. Good. Yeah. Archon of Cruelty, Gristlebrand, Atraxa. Like, there, there's, some, there's some really good creatures 
in water and free to turn the creature into. Absolutely. Uh, right, looks like we had a stern scolding stop at Esper Sentinel here on turn one. Huge play for John to have that ready. Yeah, stern scolding is a card that's really most in the modern moment, just between uh, all the Yawgmoth running around. Uh, definitely makes sense having the sideboard and some nice splash damage on Hammer. Absolutely. Uh, Kavu in play on turn two as well for John here. Going back over the Hammer player with this Plains and his opponent up there. Does have an Urza Saga card, very, very powerful in this deck. Attack after no blocks. The guard is eight has been, has been attached. Five. Five. Right, instant speed, Five. Hammer coming in. I might have spoke too soon. This one on are very, very relevant. John already down to five. Wow. And I mean, this is quite a drop from Tesco. Even if this one on gets cleaned up, there's the Quipper ready to roll. There's the Sagada to get that value. Like, oh, I, I do not envy John Hubbard's vision here. It's definitely not over, but he's got some work to do. Quite the draw from the hammer player here. I, I thought this was like, it looked like it might just be like the stern scolding might have really broken up what Francisco was trying to do. And wow, this draw is actually really, really impressive. And does John have anything? We almost got a little view of his hand there. He does have a rummage this turn if he wants. You can take a look at the top card. He doesn't have a way to, I mean, he has a scion in his hand. I guess he could chump again if he can get it into play. I don't even know. Can, can he even. <laughs> this is not looking good, Andrew. Yeah, his lands only make three colors here. Uh, it just happens to be true, given the, like, shock lands he randomly drew, not, like, his fetching, that he ends up with a steam vents in a feeding pool, which means his sign is currently not castable. This loot needs to be something good. Yeah, the loot is going to go on here. Look at the top card. So five, 17. Yes. Okay, going to take three, go to 17. You might need, like, a pick your poison on flying creature. I think that might buy him some time to figure something out. Did he just see what the card was that he drew? Is that what he drew? Did he draw a pick your poison? Oh, yeah, it, it loses flying, Andrew. Oh, God. Oh, he can't even do that. Oh man, you're right. He that drew is a pick your poison too. Wow. Yes, but if he picks artifacts, I guess I guess being an artifact might work because if there's no sacks, the hammer, and okay, I mean mission accomplished. If he sacks the ornithopter, then the hammer falls off. So okay, I guess artifact accomplishes a similar thing. Yeah, second Kavu is well behind here. So pass back over. Let's go. There's a saga on two here. So John's in this game. Really, really good territory. Okabu found that picker poison. Arslet's going to be sacrificed here. Get it on the 16, I believe. Yeah, 15, 14. Okay, there we go. Took a little bit of extra damage here these last couple turns. To be clear, as good as that draw was, it's not like John is out of the woods. I mean, this Urza Saga is going to find another hammer and equip it in one turn. It's also going to make constructs in the meantime. John's at three, so every construct is lethal. Like, he is in huge trouble still. <laughs> yeah, but that was step one. We had, we had to find something, you know, that turn. So step one achieved. Yes, and he's achieved. He runners. He achieved being alive. But <laughs> I, I'm not <laughs> yeah, sure how sure. he's going to win the game yet. Went from 0% to like 10%. We still got to, you know, make a little bit more. I'm going to do it now in case so you're It looks like we're going to go ahead and just make a construct. And pass back over. John, let's top of your deck and have it for you this time. I I wonder why he main phased the construct creation. F6 I'm not value? sure what he's playing around. Could you be F6 value? <laughs> I mean, that's always possible. But I'm wondering if he's worried about, for example, uh, Tishana's Tidebinder, which these decks sometimes play. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess if it costs you nothing to, to do that, you might as well. Yeah. I, to be clear, I'm not saying it's wrong. It definitely might be right. I'm just not sure what it means. 
Trust Federation, another sign of Draco, and a Merc Tide in John's hand here. So lots of creatures could really gum up the works here. If you're John, what are you leaning towards here? Um, well, I think the first question is, are you going to try to attack this turn? Like, can your hand even win? Right? Because if you're going to attack, you do that first. And it yep. looks like John is maybe deciding, yeah, actually, I, I don't know if my hand can win. I, I'm first going to loot and try to find something. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the something is, but it feels like by not attacking, we just have no, no outs. Uh, so, I, I like the attack. This uh, another card I, in the graveyard for Murktide, though. So this allows me to play Murktide. Well, that's true. Good point. When you make the attack, you're not necessarily locking in Murktide, though. You can, like, see what you right. draw. You know, if it seems better than Murktide, maybe you drop another pick your poison, make enchantment. I, I don't know. Like, you, you are... You can see how things play out. All right. Card draw for Can Mr. Kander here. Then we're going to go ahead and put the Urza Saga on the third chapter. Do you want to get another Iron Truck? We're going to be able to go get another hammer out of your deck if you want to do that. Lots of options for him here. He's going to contemplate just a bit. Take a look at his hand. See what the best line is from this point. I mean, it's interesting. Hammer will force a chump block, but it, it isn't... And obviously that's good, but it's not like it ends the game. Um, in fact, John Hubbard can chump and swing back for a lot next turn. Uh, Francesco definitely has to be worried about dying himself. I think that's John Hubbard's avenue to stealing this game. Is something like untap, bolt your ornithopter, attack tribal flames. I think you're right, actually. That sounds about like one of the ways to get out of this. I mean, John's been having to play on Razor's Edge here this game, so he's been doing a very good job of doing it, making sure that he's not just playing to not lose, but he's also playing to find a way to win this game. Because I think that's another important part from here is not just buying another turn, but how do I actually win from here? Yes, I think he has to get aggressive and steal it next turn. Oh boy, that's a pick your poison. That will make that much more challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd like to kill your book time, please. Hmm. Man, pick your poison is one hell of a sideboard card to show up in modern, isn't it? It really is. Boy, I mean, it, it, it sometimes feels like it's one man of vindicates. Um, it, it's it's been really good. <laughs> yeah. One man of vindicates is a good way to put it. Shadow spirit. Hmm. With the mana left over, he's got a Shadow Spear, and that's going to do it, actually. Giving Trample, I think, is going to be just too much. John's going to pack it in. Really great draw from our Hammer player here. And you know what? I'm going to give us a... I'd like to give a little shout-out to John here as well, playing super well from very far behind. Something we talked about earlier in the show earlier uh, today is, you know, trying to find a way to win from what seems like insurmountable situations. Yes, I really liked the attack with the Kavu discard. Mm -hmm. Look for an out. Your hand can't win. You've got to find something. He breaks, but he's like, okay, but if I play the Merc Tide, he has nothing. I untap. I attack to loot. If I find removal spell into Tribal Flames off those loots, I actually have it. Like, oh, I, I think he really played to give himself the best chance there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's it for this round. Uh, none of Anu's ready for us to go to break it, but I was going to say, we got to give a, a chance for Jerry Thompson and Nile Rivers to get in here and bring you home for the rest of the day. They're going to finish out the Swiss and then bring in that top eight. Andrew, I'm going to kick back on my couch, uh, maybe grab a beverage, turn this on on my big screen, and see who wins this tournament. I, I kind of feel invested now after putting in this much time <laughs> in the event. Oh, that that's that's definitely fair. Do you do you have a horse that you're uh, you you think smart money's on? Ah, uh, man, I, honestly, I don't I don't think I have a, a specific horse, but mm, I don't. know. There's been so many cool decks. I'm just hoping for a very diverse top eight. And I think we're gonna get one. All right, all right. I I, I, you? I I sort of I'm wondering about this Azurius Mill deck still. I might, maybe I'm an Azurius Mill believer now. It, it seems pretty interesting. Yeah, I was gonna say that one definitely caught my eye. Uh, maybe I had to go, maybe go, go to the closet, find the mill cards somewhere. Cause I'm a hoarder and still have everything from back in the day. So I'm going to have to go like dust <laughs> some of that stuff off and check it out. But yeah, make sure that you, uh, you stay tuned. We're going to be taking a short break. Then we'll be back with, uh, Jerry and Niall.